All right, it's good to be in this place today. I just want us to go right into the word of God this morning. Um, we're going to be reading from the book of John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Um, we're going to be reading in the New King James. John chapter 4 is uh, quite lengthy. It has about 54 verses. We're not going to go through all of them. What I want us to look at is the story that is a bit common of a Samaritan woman who is also known as the woman at the well, a story that has been called uh, the Samaritan woman meets the Messiah or meets her Messiah. Um, and I just want us to pick a few things from there. So verse 1 to 29, that's what we'll be looking at, or that's the focus of the story. But I don't want to read all of it. I just want to, I'm going to skip through, okay? So I would require, I would request that you just move along with me. I'm going to mention the verse and then we're going to go. John chapter 4 from verse 1, the Bible says, I'm reading in the New King James. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, Although Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria, verse 4. But he needed to go through Samaria. I need you to underline, if the Bible belongs to you, underline. If it is your scrolling Bible, your e-Bible, you can highlight that portion of scripture. If it is yours and you don't know how to do that, I need you to store it in your memory. He needed to go through Samaria. Now, different versions will say different things. Others will say he had to go through Samaria. Others will say he was compelled to go through Samaria. But he needed to go th through Samaria. It continues, and in verse 6 it says, Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, being tired from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. It was about noon, okay? And the woman, a woman of Samaria, came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Underline that as well. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Now that story continues and continues. And Jesus said to her in verse 10, Jesus answers and says to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. I'll read that again. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked me, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Then the woman continues in her story to just talk to Jesus from verse 11. She's letting Jesus know, uh, you have nothing to draw the water with. So even if I asked you um, to give me water, it looks practically impossible because as I look at you, you don't have the tools for this trade. All right? You don't look ready or prepared for the assignment. So I would not entrust you to give me the drinking water because the woman was not able to see at that time. Verse 13, Jesus answered and says to her, we're going to read 13 to 16, and I'm going to request that we read it together. One, two, three. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. All right? This is an interesting portion of scripture. Father, we ask that you would speak to us in accents clear and still, that when we leave this place, everyone will have their own story to give of how we encountered you personally today in your house because we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the story of a Samaritan woman might be common to you, but if it's not common to you, don't worry, you're in the right place. We've come so that we may be able to get into it today. We've read just portions of it. It's very interesting, just about 29 verses, and you, um, I promise you, you have the time in your day to go through 29 verses of John chapter 4. Very interesting. As you look at that portion of scripture, Jesus is speaking uh, to her, and I want us to just come slowly, as we've just read. The Bible says that... Um, 
Jesus is coming along the journey. They are coming to actually let us know of his, um, of his uh, what is it called, itinerary, his travel plans. He is in Judea and then he leaves Judea and departs to Galilee, but he needs to pass through a route of, um, through a city called Samaria. Now, it's interesting when we say that he needed to go through Samaria. Some of the, of, the, of the background that we might try to understand why it's important that they are mentioning Samaria and why it's an unlikely route for him to have used with him being who he was, Jesus, a Jew. Um, the Bible um, would, would give us, when, when scripture mentions something, it's important for you to, to pay attention to what scripture is saying. If it is mentioning cities, just try and, try and understand what this city is about, why are they mentioning this city, is there anything about it? There might be nothing really, but it's important just so that we don't miss any of the details. Now, some of the, of the, of the truths we need to understand or some of the things we need to know about this city is that although the road, from when you're going from Judea to Galilee, uh, the road through Samaria was the shortest route, okay? So the road through Samaria was the shortest route. But it was most likely not the one that Jews would use. And the reason is because um, those ones who are pious Jews, pious, wale wachamungu sana, wale those very religious Jews, you know those men who are very religious, you know, like you and me, those religious people, they often avoided it. And why they did was because there was a deep distrust and dislike between many of the Jewish people and the Samaritans. The Jews and the Samaritans did not like each other. They did not trust each other. And it was so much pronounced that even passing through their territory was a problem. So it's the same way if you're, coming from, uh, if you're coming from Nairobi and you're going to Meru, you can pass through Embu and you can pass through Nanyuki. Sindio? Allah? Sindio? Yes. So imagine saying that us Nairobians, us <laughs> Nairobians, do not, we, we can go through Embu, which is the shorter one, the Nanyuki one or the Embu one? The Embu one. The Embu one is shorter. But we're saying we, we can pass through the Embu route going to Meru, but us Nairobians don't use that one. We use the longer one through, through, uh, through Nanyuki, not because of the hills that and because, of, because it is, it is, um, it is uh, flatter or easier to navigate, but we use that route because we don't trust the Embians. We don't even like them. It's just an example for the Embians in the house, okay? I want you to imagine that they were willing to put themselves through the inconvenience of going extra miles just because they just didn't trust them. They just didn't like them. And that's an interesting picture that is being painted here that shows us that the Samaritans were not the favorite of all people. Bona si fiu. Now, when they, when they, just a bit of history, when the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom of Judah, they took almost all the population captive, exiling them to the Babylonian empire, empire okay? All they left behind were the lowest classes of society. Why? Because they did not want these lowest classes of society being in, in Babylon where they were. They wanted at least what we know, Medjueza. So they came, it is like they come and they raid Zimmerman, but they don't carry everybody in Zimmerman. Wanachukua tu wale watu at least wanakaa kwa maflats, watu wanakaa nini, you know? Alafu, those ones who look like they are the very low class, those ones are left behind. You can, muendele kujitawala na uhuruenu. We don't want everybody. So that's what had happened also around that time. Now, these ones that were left behind intermarried with other non-Jewish peoples who slowly came into the region, and the Samaritans emerged as an ethnic and religious group. So the Samaritans were not fully Jews, but some of the, they were Jews of those ones who remained, the ones who were of the lower class of the society, and then they were also not fully the other people because there were other ethnic groups. So Kumeshaku and exile, if there were an exile in this place, if the people of Zimmerman were carried off and taken to a different place, their houses would be left like that, vacant. And so, when they are left vacant, when other people, over the years, wananza to kukuja wanapata, ah, kuna nyumba huku bure. Asama, e plot nyangu, kutoka leo. You become the landlord of that place. You find the people there, that you intermarry with them, so they become a mixture. Do you understand where we are coming from? It's just a bit of a history class so that we can be able to understand the story about these Samaritans or where it is, it is that we are coming from. Now, because the Samaritans had a historical connection to the people of Israel, remember we said they were the ones who had been left behind, their faith was a combination of commands and rituals from the law of Moses, like the Jews, but also put together with other superstitions of the people that came came in to settle with them. So it wasn't the, the thing, it wasn't the gospel, it wasn't the true, it wasn't the laws of Moses, no. 
It was the law of Moses, a bit of it, and then some other superstitions from the people that had come. Most of the Jews in the time of Jesus despised the Samaritans, disliking them even more than the Gentiles. Because they were, religiously speaking, they were half-breeds. They were neither here nor there. That's part of the reason why the, the Samaritans were disliked. Remember we said it was mostly the pious Jews who felt like they were the ones who were religious. They upheld the laws of Moses. And so for them, it was necessary that they relate with people who were of their own caliber, faith-wise. Buenas if you. That's why they were willing to go even the extra longer route. Just to avoid these, these half-breeds. To avoid these people who are a mixture. We don't know whether they are here or there. We don't know whether they are Kenyans or not Kenyans. We don't understand. Because they have Kenyan, that's true, but they are also a mixture together with other things. That's part of the reason. So now with that bit of knowledge, when you read and it says that he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria, it brings some different kind of light into the story. Right? Because now you understand, even though Jesus was was not Jesus was not a Samaritan. He was full. He was among those ones that were fully recognized, just like the Jews, circumcised on the eighth days and on the on the eighth day, and and he was fully like this other. In fact, he was God. He is God. At that time, he also was God, walking around the earth, and so he was. He had more reason than the other pious Jews to avoid Samaritan, Samaria. Sorry, it is Samaritan to avoid Samaria. True or true. That's why it's important, particularly important for us to read that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Now, it's important, and every time I read this portion of scripture, it really excites me to think that Jesus needed. Other versions will say he was compelled. Jesus was pushed. It's like he was anxious. He had to go through Samaria. It is as if when Jesus was leaving heaven, just as he was standing at the balcony of heaven before dropping into the womb of Mary, his mother, among the itinerary of the things and the people he had an appointment with before coming to the earth was the Samaritan woman. Buonasifiwe. He did not meet the Samaritan woman many times. They didn't meet at a conference. It was that kule kuoti atayenda. It was as if I would imagine the conversation in heaven would be like, and Father, Jesus speaking to the Father and saying, and Father, of all the people I will see, I, I will make plans and make plans, please, that I may be able to meet with the Samaritan woman as well. I want you to also understand that when Jesus was on the earth, he did not meet every person that was, will, that was living at that time. Buona sifiwe. It puts more weight to the fact that Jesus had to see somebody. Of all the people that he had to meet was the daughter of Jairus, was Jairus himself, was the woman with the issue of blood. He had to meet with those people. It was in his plans in heaven. It had been written before he came from heaven to the earth. He had to meet with all those people. Some of them he met indirectly, like the throngs and the crowds of people who were around him at the time of the woman with the issue of blood. He met with those people, but he didn't really meet them. It wasn't direct. But among the people he had to have a direct conversation or direct meeting with was the Samaritan woman. This one who came from an, from a, from an outcast group of people. This one who came from, an, from an, a thrown out breed of people, religiously and ethically as well. Jesus had to meet with her. This woman was a mixture of the low class of the Jews who had been left and whatever other. We are not told about much of her descent, but we know at least she was Samaritan, mostly Samaritan. Maybe she was even fully Samaritan. Um, just the Jews who had been left behind and another Jew who had been left behind who were doing really, really badly, like really poor, really desperate, really bad. And then now her parents came together and then the woman came to be as a, as a result of that union. But among the people that Jesus had to see, that he had to interact with when he was leaving heaven was a Samaritan woman. Hallelujah. And that just really gives me so much excitement as we just begin to unravel or to open up the story of the Samaritan woman because it tells me that there are people that he has intended to meet and it gives me so much pleasure and joy to be born after the death of Jesus Christ in a time that now he says he is willing to encounter every single one of us. Hallelujah. That I, every day I am in the agenda of Jesus. That every moment I am in his plan. I know that when I wake up in the morning, Jesus has an appointment with me. In fact, if we do not meet me and Jesus during the day, it is not on him. It is on me. If you and Jesus do not meet during the day, if you do not encounter him somewhere during your day, it's not on him. Because he has bound himself to the fact that he wants to be where you are. He wants you to be where he is. Hallelujah. 
That's why God would be willing to actually put him through such a painful, shameful death at the cross. Why? So that anyone who would come into him and accept him as Lord and Savior, he would be with him and he with him. Hallelujah. The Bible will remind us of that in the book of Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens, I will come into him and I will dine with him and he with me. It says, if anyone, anyone is you, anyone is me, we are anyone and anyone is us. It gives us so much excitement to think you are in the plan of Jesus. Hallelujah. Listen to your neighbor, tell them, I'm in his plan. Oh, please turn to somebody else and tell them, I'm in his plan. It gives us so much excitement to just unravel that and realize that he needed to go through Samaria and not so that he can see the scenic views. It was so that he can meet with a person, a woman, in fact. The title of my message is The Living Water. Jesus Christ, The Living Water. So he comes to this city and he enters the city of Samaria, um, which is called Sychar, and the woman of Samaria comes to draw water. Now, we had also underlined that it was the 12th hour, it was noon. Now, in those places and those people who went to the trip, the, the Israel trip, um, would tell us that it is hot. It is very hot. Now, if you look again at history, it will tell you that most of the women of that time would go to fetch water during the early morning when it is cool or during the evenings from this well. Why? Because when you're going to fetch water during the heat of the sun, when it is very hot, it's very difficult. It's like the water becomes even heavier. <laughs> it's not scientific, but yeah. Yeah? It's, there's just a general laziness. Hata ukienda kulima, unataka kwenda kulima mapema. Ndiyo by the time jua inakuwa moto inakupata umesonga songa. Ama just generally, okay, nikisema kulima pia kuna wenye wa understand hata naisamia nini. Kulima? <laughs> Whatever it is that you want to do, I, I find it is so much easier to work in the morning. I'm such a morning person. I prefer to work early in the morning. Because by the time the sun is coming up, it becomes so hot, it become, you become so lazy, you just, you know. So, for the woman to go to the well, and then um, um, Pastor Sikuku here recently shared with us, talking to us about come see a man, he shared with us why she had to go through in the after, to the place to fetch water in the afternoon. It was because she was part of the, she was twice outcast. She was outcast twice, okay? She was first of all a woman of Samaritan descent. She was a Samaritan woman. And then also in addition to that, she was a tricky woman. <laughs> I want to say a woman of the night, but clearly she's not of the night. She's out in the day. She was a tricky woman. So she was twice outcast. So it would fit her well to go and fetch water during the day. As I was reading various commentaries, it's interesting to find commentators trying to, to, to try and just uncover. What do you think the water was for? I don't think it's important, but they're trying to ask, what do you think the water was for? And most of them, a crazy number, is just actually saying that, I think the water was to go and try to wash off the dirt and the filth of her previous customers so that she can prepare for her next assignment. That only continues to tell you the nature of the woman that Jesus was going to meet with. Not that he had just planned. You see, this is not just a woman that Jesus met by the roadside. I want you to go back to that point that we said earlier. He had to pass through Samaria. He had to meet with this woman. In fact, when he was coming from heaven, he had seen the plans. He had seen the woman. He knew our omniscient God had known the kind of woman, the nature of her character, and he still had slaughtered her into her, his very busy schedule. It gives me so much joy to realize that Jesus is not phased. To be phased is to be shocked, to be perturbed, to be bamboozled. <laughs> Jesus is unperturbed by our issues. It reminds me of something Pastor Kibera likes to share with us. And he says that when Jesus Christ was dying on the cross at Calvary, all your sins were future. Think about it for a minute. When he was dying at the cross... All your sins were future. Because none of us were born about 2,000 years ago. Nobody that is existing right now was born back then. And we have the confidence of saying today, he died for all my sins. Which sins? Future sins. So what does future include? My past sins, my present sins, and the sins I will commit until the day I die, 
everything has been catered for by Jesus. There's nothing that Calvary did not cover. Now, is that a license for me to live as I please? Certainly not. What is that, however? It is just a pronouncement that there is now, therefore, no condemnation to the person that is in Christ. That there is no extent that the cross did not cover. He went right into the depth and to the thick of it, and he took care of every single thing. I love that portion of, of scripture in Colossians, is it 2.15, that talks about how he went right down and he took all of, of captivity and he tore apart the warrant of arrest that was written against us and he put it on that cross, that shameful cross, everything, the itinerary or itemized list of sin, different versions call it different things. But I want you to imagine, dhambizako tangu ile siku ulizaliwa, kutoka siku za kuiba na kulamba skari hadi zile zingine. All those things, itemized list of sin, he took it when he hung on Calvary and he tore it apart. That was like your warrant of arrest. When the police are coming to arrest you, they will mostly appear and they have a warrant of arrest. They are saying, oh, well, not in, not in this country, okay, in the movies. <laughs> in the movies, they will come with a warrant of arrest because they will show up at your door and you're asking them, do you have a warrant? <laughs> Don't try this at home. <laughs> but <laughs> in, a, in an ideal world... <laughs> They're supposed to have a warrant of arrest. And they shouldn't take you anywhere without a warrant. Now, when the enemy was coming, he had every right to arrest you and I. The same way he had every right to arrest the Samaritan woman. The same way he had the Samaritan woman was if Jesus would have passed by and not gone through the city to meet with her, there was nothing wrong because she was deserving of every punishment that was coming to her. But God. Hallelujah. But God. He came and he took that itemized list of sin, that warrant of arrest that had been written against you and against me, and he ripped it apart. He actually nailed it to the cross. What did he say? It is finished. Hallelujah. That gives me so much excitement to think that that was the assignment of Jesus, that he had to come to the earth. And even though I was not there at that time, Part of the reason was that he had, through, he had to pass through Samaria for that woman, but he also had to pass through Calvary to meet with me. Hallelujah. I want you to realize that this story is not just a vacant story because you're not there. There's, the space that you occupy here is found in the fact that Jesus finally hung on that cross for you and for me. So we see him having to pass through Samaria for this woman and having to pass through Calvary for you and for me. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor again, I'm in his plan. Hallelujah. Oh, that ought to give us so much excitement to think that there's nothing that God has not been able to handle. Let's just try to wrap this up. Because it is, it is common when the woman now is starting to have a conversation with Jesus. She's telling him, <laughs> Jesus is telling him, if you knew, if you knew the person it is, that is telling you, give me a drink. You would have asked him and he would have given you the living water. First of all, the woman's eyes have not been opened. So she stumbles over what little she knows about, about Jesus. First of all, she knows nothing about him. They don't know each other. So she just looks at the outward appearance and she's like, so where's your drawing can? This one you're telling me you'll give me water. Where's your drawing can? That's actually what she says. Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is very deep. Where then do you get that you're living water? Are you greater than our father, Jake? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Are you better? Hmm? Are you greater than him? You see, many times we stumble like this woman. We read this story and we think, this woman is so rude. But no, don't be so quick to judge the Samaritan woman because you and I are just like her. We find ourselves tripping over what little we know about Jesus. We know so much about our situation, so we trip over what little we know about the one who can help us, the living water. We know so much about our drought and our thirst. We've been with our thirst, we have our longing. When I say thirst, I mean the longing for the things that we desire. You desire ambition, you have ambition, you desire wealth, you desire greatness, you desire riches, you desire, you desire great things in this life. All of us have great desires for ourselves and for our children. And so because of those things, we have this thirst that needs quenching. And we try to quench our thirst with so many other things. You're seated, and by the way, let me just submit to you, it is not a bad thing to desire things. The Bible assures us that God is willing to, if we delight ourselves in him, he's willing to grant us or to satisfy the desires of our hearts. So the desires of our hearts are valid. But as we are thinking about those things, it's important for us to settle ourselves in the place of knowing that my desires can only be satisfied fully in Jesus. 
Hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. So many times we know about our thirst. We know about our condition because you've been with it for so long. You know about our family. You know your family history. You've been in your family for since you were are, you are born. So you have a hard experience with it. So it is only you know, sensical for you when you meet with Jesus at your situation, for you to start being thinking, for you to start thinking. <laughs> so even this one, you want to tell me this one will, I don't know whether you're like me. Are you, are you, do you find yourself sometimes, there are things you don't ask for from God. There are things you ask for, but there are things you don't. Are you like me? Oh no, just me? Okay, let me tell you about myself then. There are, there are things I, I find myself, it's just not natural. To ask for, you know, you just, uh, these things have been like this for so long. By the way, that might be the reason why you don't pray for your country the way you, you ought to pray for your country. Because we've been in this country for so long. We have gotten into the system. I want you to ask yourself, if you think about applying for a passport in Kenya, do you just think the systems are so great, I'm just going to go and apply and just sit home and wait? The first thought that comes to your head is like, Ninani ni najua anafanya kazi huko? Kuna mundugu anafanya huko wa kanisa? See if it's baya kujua watu wenye anafanya kazi huko. But you know, the reason why we ask about that is because it's so, it's, it's, nimesha zoea, so survival for the fittest, mi najua watu huko ndani, si mi ni pate passport. Yangu alafu wenye wajui mtu sawa tadu, wa, ni tough. Prayers up for them. And that's just one example. Think about the things in your family, in your school, at your place of work, those things that have always been done this way. They could get better, but nobody bothers with them. It's just like, we trip over what little we know about Jesus, and it's because our issues are oh so profound, and we have sat with them for so long. But Jesus brings the good news. He begins to speak with her and lets her know from verse 13. Jesus answered, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, this water that you're giving people. But whoever drinks of the water I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I give him will become to him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. It's interesting for me in verse 15 that the woman says, sir, <laughs> after Jesus had, she doesn't need much convincing. He's just like, sir, <laughs> give me this water. So that I may not thirst. I want you to know that the woman was not, she had not caught the revelation of what she was being told. She was just ready for the convenience of not having to come at the hottest part of the day so that there are no people. Because she was twice outcast. So she was coming to fetch water in a convenient time when people are not so much there. Later we see that Jesus is telling her, where you even have five men, even the one in your house is not your husband. True, true. They're like, my, yo, it's true. Speak to me, man of God. Go deeper. By the time she's coming to that place of being open, she's coming in the afternoon kwa sababu waneza kuja kuchora maji ya subuhi alafu apatane na ule mama mwenye buwana yake ya kondani ya nyumba yake. Una dhani yoni vita inakaje? Akirushu wa ndani yoyo wel nani atamtoa? So the woman used to come at a convenient time. Jua kitokea sazile wasewa natokea kwa manini, kwa matura in the villages. By the time anatokea hizo matime, anapata pia Sama, ndiyo kale kamama. Kenye kakona buwana ya mama nani? Sule ndiyo kona baba nani? We? So the woman, every time, I would imagine she was living such a burdened life. I don't want you to imagine for a second that that woman was comfortable with the life she was living. Because if you're not comfortable with the life that you used to live before Jesus, and if you're here, you're not born again. If you're not comfortable, I know you're not comfortable with the life that you're living right now, of having to work for yourself. When there's somebody that has been given that can work for you, that you'll never have to work alone. It's not a comfortable life, don't you, for a, th for a second think. If it's not easy for you, it was easy for her. She kept looking over her, her shoulders every time. Just to, she must have been covering herself back in the day, just walking around thinking, Ninani atanipata leo? Ninani tutaonana? Maybe many times she would, she would go long without water. She would be thirsty for many years. I want you to think about the woman for a minute. Don't just pass through her, the character of the woman. I want you to imagine that many times she would be carrying her jar of water just passing by. And just before she gets to the well, she will see Mama Nani begin to approach. And she's like, husband number two belonged to that Mama Nani. And so she would pass by the well and go her own way. And she would come back in the evening hoping that she would find nobody. And she would come back and find... Um, 
yeah, pia watoto wa husband number three wako pale. So she would go her own way. That would mean that day she has gone the whole day without water in her house. So she had been thirsty. She had gone through a lot. I would only imagine, it's not mentioned directly in the text, but I would only imagine. So when Jesus offers her the opportunity of never having to thirst again, she jumps at the opportunity. She's not jumping at the opportunity for the living water. She's jumping at the opportunity for convenience. She's ready for the convenience that Jesus is offering her. She's jumping at it. She's ready. She's quite excited. She's thinking, <laughs> yeah, please. Please give me that water. Now, if you're judging the woman harshly also, I want you to think about yourself. I want you to think about the many times that we find in us, ourselves in, in places where nothing seems to satisfy or quench our thirst. And so the first moment that somebody is offering something that seems to be quenching our thirst, either at work, in, in your home, in your family, in your ministry, wherever it is, the first opportunity you get of somebody telling you, I can give you this, you're, you're willing to take it. I want you to think about the reason you gave your life to Jesus. Many times you might find it was out of convenience. When I gave my life to Christ the first time, I've given this story here before, it was out of convenience. Why? Because the Form 1s at that time, hawakuwa na monolaiziwa. Form 1s wa CU hawakuwa na monolaiziwa. Because ikifika at 9.30, perhaps ije, 9.25, kuna ma brothers, brothers in the Lord who used to come. A brother assigned to every Form 1 brother, new believer. Nakuja, anakuchukua kwa darasa, anakuchukua, anakupeleka kwa prayers. Munaenda power room, na mkimaliza, munafanyua ka discipleship hapo. So by the time Form, form 1s wengine, wale ma, na unbelieving Form 1s, wakitoka class, the other Form 4s are waiting for them. It is like when you're watching the, the wildebeest crossing the Mara. Kuna manini crocodiles in Angoja tu hivi. Ziki pita tu hivi na naswa. So that's what used to happen. They are waiting for the four months to just talk out, then they catch you. So for me, it was convenient to give my life to Jesus because I'm thinking, oh, so you're telling me what am I getting in this deal? Nikiokoka mtakuwa mna nikujia before. So I am escaping the corruption that is in the world. <laughs> so I will not be taken to go and do other bad chores. Kufulia mtu socks. Mtu mtu wa rugby unamfulia socks. That is just unsanitary, <laughs> to say the least. So for me, it was out of convenience. It is only much later that I came to realize or to get the, the revelation of what it is. For me to come and hear that Jesus can truly save and satisfy and sustain. Jesus is able to fill and quench your thirst completely. Because the woman is like a lot of many of us. We want the gift of an eternal life, but we want, we want it with the convenience of, without the convenience of daily dying to ourselves. We want it without the, the, the work of saying no to ungodliness. We just want to be born again. Because manze ukiokoka, ukiokoka, kwanza umeokoka kanisa kama Deliverance Church International Kasarani Zimmerman. Kuna ma networks. Una belong kwa hizo ma networks kwa sababu ya nini? Ukiwa na party unapata watu wakuita. Na ukiwa na mazishi, Ata uta waita. Wana anguko kwa 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 mama wako jikoni, wana sugua masufuria, wana kufanyia, wana kufanyia. Ma networks. Ama sell. It is so convenient. Well, it might inconvenience you kidogo. Unambiwa, unambiwa na sell leader wako. Uh, we want you to share the, the content. This week you'll be taking us through. I'm sorry, I'm not available. Work has become very... The moment we start requiring, or the Lord starts to require a bit of your convenience, it, becomes to, it begins to inconvenience us just a little bit. Then we are like, mm, yeah, psych, <laughs> guys. Kidogo to Ngojeni, I'm so busy. <laughs> Let me give this story here. <laughs> when we did the Bishop's Karibu, um, ah, names withheld. <laughs> But one of, the, one of the examples that we had was very interesting, somebody sharing with us and saying, you know the way we give names, like if you, if you are a visitor, if you're a visitor here today, Karibu Sana, we're going to be inviting you well, properly at the end of this, but we'll take your name and we'll add you to a cell, a network, or something like that, because this is a cell church. We believe in doing life in the small groups, okay? Because you might get lost in the multitude. So <laughs> somebody has been added to the cell, and they're like, oh, cell, so cell, if you're going through something, we'll be there for you. We will be there for your growth, your spiritual growth. We will grow together even in life. If you want people to celebrate with you, we'll be there to, we want to do life together. You're like, yes. Who doesn't want people to do life with them? And then I'm like, okay, so say, let you know, patana sa easy. So I'm like, hmm, you're my okay, uh, tukona sale ya mchana, hmm, ata yomchana siko. 
Okay, kuna kuanga na prayers. Mm, hata hiyo siko. Uko sure unataka kuwa kwa cell? Eh, nataka sana, nataka sana. Sema aya, una kuanga available. Ni we are willing to create a cell just for you. Sema aki sikuangia available. I work 24 hours. When I am not working, I am in school. When I am not in school, I am attending to my small children. I'm like, hey, there's somebody that is that busy in this life. Okay, what time do you sleep? Aki hata silalangi. <laughs> when you hear such stories, you're thinking, ah! I mean, <laughs> we might be laughing at that person, but imagine in many areas of our lives, we, we are okay with, we, we love the idea of Jesus in our lives. We love the idea of a powerful savior. We love the idea of a strong and mighty king. We love the idea of a Lord and savior who is telling us, do this, do that. But when the Lord and savior starts actually being Lord and savior, saying, stop this, do not do this, go and apologize to this one right away, we are like, ah! will Lord and savior do his place? Unakaa pale hadi ni kuinvite. Nitakuita siku ya crisis. The woman at the well was like that. She was like, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst or come here to draw. You're saying you're going to give me water that... She, the reason why she wants the water is so that I may never be thirsty and should I ever be thirsty, I will never come here to draw because I have the living water in the house every time. Because coming here to draw is a lot of inconvenience. It is putting me through a hard time. I want you to notice as we bring this to a close, the example or the, the answer that Jesus gave her. Jesus says to her, go call your husband and come here. Many times we might look at that statement as if it is removed from the conversation that they are having. The woman has just said, give me water. And then Jesus is telling her, go and bring your husband. Henry Alford puts it this way. He says, I am persuaded that the command of Jesus to go and put and get her husband was the first step of granting her request, give me this water. It is not removed. Jesus is not answering her happy story. To get this water, step one, go and bring your husband. Why? Because the first work of the Spirit of God is to convince us of sin. To reach those unevangelized pockets of sin in our hearts. Many times when you're telling the Lord, Lord, I want to be close to you. Lord, I want more of you. Lord, I want so and so. Lord, I want the Lord is calling you out and he's saying, okay, go and forgive your neighbor. I'm like, no. Oh. See, let's just stick to the topic. But God is sticking to the topic because the first work of God, of his Holy Spirit, is to convict us of sin. I love this example that is given many times that the, the Spirit of God is like a big, bright, shining light or big torch. Before he comes into your life, all of it is like you're seated in a dark room have, enjoying a nice candlelit dinner. The candle is just there. It's all dim, nice. You can't see beyond the eyes of the person you're having dinner with. It's all nice and cozy. You can just see the nice, fresh stem of rose on the table. You can't even see the food that you're eating very clearly. Have you ever been to a, a, nini, a candlelit dinner? No? Tengeneza candlelit dinner kwa nyumba sa zingine. Singoje KPLC wafanya ile kitu ndiyo na weo ufanya yoni. Sa zingine unazima tu stima, itakukusei vio cost. Ya tokens, I promise. Wajoshia tu katochi, vika candle tu. Unambia watu wako, gather around the table today, we are doing candle leads. It might take a while for your younger children to understand the concept. Vitu zitavunjika zingine kidogo, ujua waoni, but nini. But always miss mdomo, si unona? E connection na kuanga very direct. <laughs> So the Spirit of God, before he comes into our lives, it's like we're sitting nice, having a nice, you know, candlelit dinner. We're enjoying ourselves. It's all going all good and all nice, all wonderful. You can't see beyond. You don't even know what is around the room. You might be seated in a dumpster, but you don't even know it. You're just seeing the person right next to you. It's all nice. Oh, wow, your eyes are glowing. The candlelight. But then when you turn on the bright light, unawasha steamer hivi, it exposes cockroaches carrying up the wall. It exposes boxes and cartons strewn across the floor. It exposes how your dinner date has not even washed their face. They are just looking bad. You're just, you're just like, wow, what has happened to the room? No, not what has happened to the room. The light has just come to expose what was already happening. That's what the Spirit of God does. 
And when the Spirit of God comes into the life of a person, yours and mine, among the things he will do is to expose, to reveal to you and I pockets of sin that remain yet unevangelized for the believer. Because we have opened the heart or the, the door to Jesus Christ. But what we have done is that we have only opened the main door. Most of us have not opened the smaller doors to the rooms. Have you ever gone to a house when you've moved in and you have been given the key and you enter into a house, they tell you, Iyo nyumbayote niyako. the same way you do to your house technicians. You see the way you do to your house technicians. Unambia sasa, kikuja sikia kwanza, unamfanya orientation, huku ndiyo nyumbani, karibu sana, kutoka leo, huku ni kwako. Kwa sababu ume okoka, umuambia kangi kitchen peke yake. Unamuambia tandika mattress, jikoni, huku ndiyo kwako. Na tukiamuka asubui, tusigongane na we usingizini, please. Unamuka three, unatoa mavitu zako, unakunja. So you do, hmm? Okay, not you, those ones. Those other people. So you've told your house technician, in nyumba ni yako yote, yote. Alafu yeah, ukienda kazini kesho, anajua, ah, si yuku ni kwangu kote. Anaenda huko, anafungua jikoni, anafungua choni, anafungua kila, anafika ile mlangwa, anapata kumefungwa. Iyo ndiyo inaitwa nini? Master bedroom. Umefunga na kifuli umeyeka huku umeenda nayo kazini. Kifungua huko hata hizi ya kaingia. Amekaa na wewe five years. Watoto wako wameingia pipi wano, wametoka, wamepata laptop ya sirikali. Hajawai ono hiyo room inakaa na mnagani uko ndani. It's exactly some of what we do to God. When he comes into our lives, we are like, God, I open up my heart to you. And God comes into the heart and he's ready to just transform that home. But he has no sooner landed than he realizes only the living room of your heart is opened. The woman was willing to give to Jesus the key to the main house, but the doors, the compartments, <laughs> she was willing to go back with them. But blessed be God, because the woman had a soft heart. Oh, I pray that we would react towards Jesus like the woman at the well. That when Jesus is saying, go and bring your husband, you're like, mm, I, am, I have no husband. So that Jesus says to us, you have said correctly, because you've had five, and even the one that is in your house is not your own. The woman is like, ah, it is true. And you will now run out and go and bring back the good news, telling people, come and see the man who has told me everything there is to know about myself and even more. I want to give you a minute to just close your eyes if you can and just begin to let Jesus know that, God, I know I have allowed you into my heart, but mostly it has been out of convenience. When you start to convict me and to tell me, stop doing this, stop doing that, stop, it becomes a bit difficult. I want you to make that prayer. You know your life. Our lives are not the same. Our lives are very different, as different as our names are. Just begin to let the Lord know, God, this is where I have shut you out. And today, even though it's very, very hard, it might be very inconveniencing, but I want to open that I want to open that part of my heart again. I want to open it up again. I want to allow you to come even into that place. I want you to shine your bright light and expose those things in me. Expose them to me so that I may repent of those things. In the name of Jesus. Come on, lift up your voice. Lift up your voice and make that prayer today in the name of Jesus Christ. So that we are not asking God just for things and we are not, we are not pausing to to look at what those things look like. We want freedom, Lord Jesus, but when the Lord is giving us true freedom, it will start by him exposing to us where the chains are. And most of the times, the chains are hidden in the places where we don't want to show people. But you can trust Jesus this morning. He's the living water. And when you drink of him, you will never be thirsty again. He says, if you drink of this water, you will never be thirsty again. It will become a fresh bubbling spring within you giving you life just one more minute make that prayer ask the Lord to help you to drink every day this drinking that we will do is not just a one time thing we will drink today and tomorrow we will drink we will drink in the morning and in the afternoon we will need to drink of him because to drink is to accept conviction and to repentance to drink is to take his correction to drink is to commit to daily change to drink is to release ourselves to his means of cleansing. To drink is to allow him to truly be Lord and Savior. To drink is to walk with him even though it might be inconveniencing to us. Because soon we will realize what looked like inconvenience was actually our freedom. It might have been dressed in rags, but it was a beautiful thing coming to us all along. To drink daily. Lord Jesus Christ, we cry out. Help us to drink. Help us to drink. Help us to drink daily to drink of the living water, to drink of you, our Lord and Savior. Help us to drink of you. Oh, help us to seed ground, to open ourselves up to you more and more. 
We want that our response would be like of the, that of the Samaritan woman, daily releasing ourselves honestly to you because you have been compelled to come and meet us. I pray that we'll not run away from you who has come to meet us. We will be open to conversing with you because to talk to you is to find life, even life eternal. Help us to open ourselves to you, Lord Jesus. If you're here, you've not given your life to Jesus. I'd like to bring you the good news that Jesus needed to pass through Calvary to meet with you. He needed to pass through this place this morning to meet with you. If you're here, if you lift your hand quickly, we will see it and we'll pray together with you, leading you to the Lord. He needed to come to this place and is here just to meet with you. Are you here? If you lift your hand, we'll see it quickly and pray for you. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you'll continue to speak to us, O oh God, even long after we've left this place, because you are good and besides you there is no one else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.